welcome to the Drexel interview. I'm Paula Morantz Cohn, a professor of English at Drexel and host for the show. Today, our guest is Diane Ravitch, educator, researcher, former assistant secretary of education. She is also the author of numerous books, including most recently, The Language Police, How Pressure Groups Restrict What Children Learn. Well, welcome to the Drexel interview, Diane. I'm Ravitch. delighted to be here, Paul. Thank you. There has always been controversy about what we teach our children. Um, do you feel that there's more controversy now than ever before, and do you feel that education perhaps is in a worse way than it's been in the past? Well, I think that uh, there's certainly lots of controversy today. What I tried to focus on in my book uh, is, the, to me, the incredible scandal of the extent to which textbooks and the passages that appear on test are uh, censored. Uh, they're censored because of uh, the demands of pressure groups from all different political directions and the, uh, the extent to which these pressure groups influence the state boards of education and the textbook selection process, particularly in the big states, Texas and California, mm -hmm. uh, which then uh, lead the textbook publishers to censor themselves and to censor their authors and their illustrators and then the rest of the states, uh, whether it's New Jersey or New York or any other state in the country that doesn't have state textbook adoption, ends up choosing a book that's already been, uh, in effect, sanitized for the Texas market mm. or the California market. Because that's what, what is out there? Because uh, we have today a, a, a national textbook publication industry Mm -hmm. And the biggest place to sell textbooks is those two states because they have such large populations. And they, they, have, a, they have a process where they buy textbooks for the entire state. Mm -hmm. So in a state like uh, New York, for instance, where we don't have state textbook adoption, we're left to choose amongst these books that have already been censored for the benefit of the State Board of Education in those two big states of California and Texas. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I guess before I ask you what might be done to counter this, because I imagine there might be ways in which states or perhaps citizens groups could, could you tell us a little bit about the censorship itself? Give us some of your favorite or I guess most disturbing examples of the sort of censorship you're seeing, the sanitizing you're seeing in textbooks. Well, the, what I did in uh, researching the book was to uh, contact publishers and, and sometimes even go behind their back to get copies of what they call their bias guidelines. And whether they're test publishers or textbook publishers, uh, they all, and or state departments of education, they have long list of words and topics and images and what they call stereotypes uh, mm -hmm. that will not appear in textbooks or in tests. Uh, the state of New Jersey, for example, has a, a bias review committee that uh, reviews test items for students who are gonna take, I think it's the 11th grade test in, this, in New Jersey. And um, most recently, and it was after my book was published, I learned that uh, a short story by Langston Hughes was removed from the state test as a possible source of test questions because Langston Hughes uses words like uh, uh, Negro and colored. Mm -hmm. And that means that you just can't use the Langston Hughes short story because those were the words he used. That was the era that he wrote in. And he himself, of course, was black. And he, of course, yeah. was black. And yeah. so uh, the sensitivity committee felt that they didn't want children to see those words, so his story was removed. Uh, there, there was a story also by Garrison Kaler, which was autobiographical, uh, where he talked about uh, the kids in the high school assembly were applauding a girl extra hard because her mother had recently died of cancer. And the bias reviewer said, oh, some children will be so upset if they see the word cancer uh, that they had to remove that entire story. Um, but I found that there were hundreds of words that are routinely uh, mm -hmm. removed. Uh, the word like brotherhood is considered a, now considered a gender biased word. Um, what and, word do they use instead of brotherhood? Oh, community or amity, um, mm -hmm. anything that does not have the implication that gender is involved. And uh, much of this kind of, of censorship and self censorship and sanitizing started. Uh, with the vengeance in the late 60s and early 70s in response to uh, feminist complaints that the textbooks were gender biased. And there was uh, certainly a grain of justice in their complaints because 
uh, the, the Dick and Jane star readers gave all the actor roles to the boys and the girls just mm -hmm. stood by and applauded or watched. And, and so the effort to make everything gender fair uh, led from you know, being aware and being sensitive to having girls be as creative and as active and involved as boys to uh, removing any word that had those wicked three letters, M-A-N. So a word like man-made or manpower is not used anymore. Really? Uh, no. The word okay, craftsmanship so is considered. These are, these are on the list these of are on the taboo words. Yeah, mm. and, and these lists are found everywhere. I'm talking, uh, for instance, uh, ETS, uh, ACT, you know, the major college entrance exams. ETS even uh, bans words like heretic, extremist, mm. cult, or dogma, because these are considered to be uh, ethnocentric words. You know, someone who's a heretic to you uh, in their own eyes is not a heretic, you're the heretic, so no one should be a okay. heretic. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the publishers have, most of their lists look a lot alike, and then every once in a while you find somebody who gets a new spin on this and says, well, you can't say senior citizen, and you can't say the elderly. And, and that you, gets added probably then to all the lists. Right. Is and it then, that they, they exchange lists? Well, uh, they, they all know what's, what's on the core list. The core list is uh, the, anything that begins or ends with man is no good, so, mm -hmm. I mean, you are with ESS. So you could not, for instance, have referred to Katherine Hepburn as an actress. She could only be an actor. Hmm. Um, are I you have not noticed the absence of actress. Yes, except in, in yeah. all the obituaries when she died recently. She, the newspapers all called her an actress. Okay. And if you watch the Academy Awards, they do have awards for actress of the year and be, you know best mm -hmm. actress and best supporting. But testing, actress. in testing, it's in not testing, allowed. it's gone. That's any any word that refers to gender is uh, considered an unacceptable word, and it's extended now to uh, bring in lots of other categories. And and you know it, in textbook it includes illustrations. So for instance, uh, you're not supposed to show a, a cow with an udder because the udder is too sexual. Mm -hmm. And this is very disturbing to some people to see an udder on a cow, even though it's anatomically incorrect to have a cow. But see, these seem to me udder. to be two different issues. One mm -hmm. would be, I guess, the sensitivity to political correctness. The other would be a sensitivity to sexuality or right. to biology. That's different. Well, but yet they get they get blurred. Well, what that? happens is that it's different groups complaining about different things, but the mm -hmm. publishers are equally willing to uh, acquiesce to all of them because they don't want to have ire from the right, and they don't want to have ire from feminists, and they don't want to have ire from people who say, I represent uh, people with disabilities. And so uh, there are a long list of words and depictions that you can't use referring to older people or disabled people, or, and, or you can't use what's considered a stereotypical depiction of all sorts of ethnic groups. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, like an, an American Indian wearing a, a headdress or feathers is considered a stereotype, even though it may have been historically accurate, the photograph will not be used. Interesting. Um, I want to get back to what you said before, though, when you mentioned that, um, you know, of course, textbooks in the past were gender biased, and this was initially an effort to correct that bias, and it seems to have swung too far in one direction. Do you think, perhaps, though, that's the way history moves, that there is a tendency to move too far and then readjust, and this is part of the process of revision that we naturally must go through in order to reach some sort of... Well, I, d I don't think we're at a happy medium. I think that what, what happens so often, and, and you know, my field is history and of education, what happens so often is that uh, movements in American education tend to go too far, and I've become mm -hmm. almost allergic to the word movement. As soon <laughs> as somebody says they're part of a movement in education, yeah. I don't want to have anything to do with it anymore because there's a tendency to just push things too far in one direction or another. And I don't think that education benefits from that because mm -hmm. um, we know too much to allow things to go to the extremes that we do. Uh, but I think that in, in terms of uh, what's happened to the textbooks, it's not a question of, gee, now we took them to this extreme of removing all the controversy, now we'll put the controversy back. Mm -hmm. I think that we've reached a kind of political climate in the textbook publishing industry where uh, it's almost impossible to introduce, let's say, honest, critical history. Mm. Uh, so, for instance, when the textbook history, when the histories, high school histories, deal with contemporary issues in the uh, Middle East, they don't do so honestly because they're afraid of ethnic sensitivities. Mm. And so all the textbook publishers now, especially in history, 
have a multicultural advisory board and they will go to the groups whose interests are affected and say, is this language okay with you? And the groups will say, no, take it out, and they take it out. And so... Um, well, what's left when they take it out? And what's left is yeah. just these kind of bland descriptions of mm -hmm. a world and that has no interest, no peaks and valleys. Uh, and so, for instance, there's no real understanding that's conveyed or no real thoughtful discussion of the problem of terrorism. There's yeah. no real serious discussion or thoughtful discussion of the problem of Islamic fundamentalism. And in some of the textbook accounts, it's not even an issue. And women seem to be very happy, um, you know, covered head to toe. And it's, it's something that seems to be not an issue. And a lot of things that we, in the world today, we would say are big issues, you know, like the genocide in Rwanda, mm -hmm. where almost a million people were killed uh, in a, brutally. That was in our lifetime, that was 10 years ago, and yet the textbooks dispense with it, usually in about two sentences or maybe three. Because they feel they can't deal with it in a way that would... Well, first of all, they don't have space to deal with anything mm -hmm. in any depth. Uh, but when they get to something where there's controversy and violence, they tend to just gloss over it very quickly with a compressed paragraph. Uh, the same would be true of dealing with, with the problem of dictatorship in Latin America or in Africa. And, mm -hmm. You know, you could look to the Sudan and say, is there something that kids will learn from their history studies that will enable them to understand these terrible ethnic conflicts? And the answer is no. Right. It's all paper And over. yet it is a dilemma, don't you think? In other words, to try and present these things uh, in some way that's complex right. would take a great mind, a great writer, we don't have so many of them anywhere to lessen textbook writing and publishing. Well, the, what do you see as the solution to this problem? I think that, that it's different, different kinds of problems, and I, yes. I sort of separate them. In history, the problem for me is, to, is, is the textbook itself. And I think that today there are such great resources on the Internet. Mm -hmm. The problem with the Internet is a lot of the resources are completely irresponsible and they're, you can't filter out truth and fiction. Uh, but I think that in history, what I would recommend is that you shouldn't use any written material that doesn't have an author's name on it. Mm -hmm. And many of the high school history textbooks have no author. And when there's an, no author, you know that it's been processed through committee after committee, and, and there only are editors' names on it, no, mm -hmm. no writers. So I would say that if I were talking to high school history teachers, I'd say use history, it present different points of view, let kids see the debates and let them engage in the issues, but let them hear a voice where somebody signed their name to it. If they don't, if they, if no one has a name on it, then, then you know that you're that. getting something sanitized, and that's yeah. what mostly they're getting. In the literature textbooks, the problem is that they're just dreadful. I mean, they, the, what what the um, textbook publishers want to do is they want to ex expose kids to a range of genre and you mm -hmm. know have lots of women authors and lots of Hispanic authors and African American authors. But they don't have, make any attempt to say there is a literary tradition. These are the really great writers that you should have mm -hmm. read some of, and, and here's some of the really great things they've written, a and enable them to see that there are discriminations you make between what's really ter excellent and what's not so excellent. What they do is they mix in everything, and so you will find in a literature textbook um, how, to, how to read a telephone book mm -hmm. or an excerpt from the script of Zena Warrior Princess or all sorts of... Uh, drivel about how to read and how to how to preview what you're going to mm -hmm. read and how to review what you just read and pedagogical advice that belongs in a teacher's guide and with no sense textbook. of literary quality no, no. which brings me to another I guess pet peeve of yours which has to do with the training of teachers and the idea that schools of education give degrees that focus on pedagogy which is of course important to some extent but give short shrift to the field itself, whether it's English or history, so that you often have teachers that really haven't read in the literary tradition or who aren't trained as historians. And that, of course, makes it difficult for them to be in a position to choose the text that you see. I, I think that we've had a very big problem in this country, and it's not new, it's gone on for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, with teachers not having mastered any field and with uh, so many requirements in pedagogy that uh, their their liberal studies have been slighted, and uh, whenever there's any kind of a, a test, like Massachusetts gave a, a